was that Bill O'Reilly says? Do it live. <laughs> well, while uh, landslide is installing and while I'm compiling my slides and installing Python and recompiling Linux, I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, Twisted and Conch and uh, what that is. Um, if you, I'll just tell you about Twisted first of all. It's a uh, asynchronous networking framework. Um, it uses an abstraction called a deferred, which was invented by someone named Glyph a long time ago and has been picked up by many other projects out there for uh, coordinating uh, asynchronous control flows. And so Conch then is a implementation of the uh, SSH version two protocol in Twisted, uh, pure Python. Uh, it uses PyCrypto for a few things, so there, there are uh, some C code in there. Hopefully in the future, um, when it's possible to, to do all crypto in pure Python, uh, we will have that available. Okay, let's see about these slides. Well, Okay, well, I guess we're ready to get started. I've got all the material that, uh, that I have. So uh, my name's Eric Mangold. I'm a uh, longtime contributor, well, sometime contributor on Twisted and um, a developer with Katura Video. And we're the guys that did all the, the lecture capture here. So it was very nice of them to put my talk at the end so that I could just sort of maximize stress in the beginning and then put it all at the end. But um, actually, it's a lot better than having the talk in the middle or in the beginning. Um, and yeah, at most of the time I'm just causing trouble with Twisted, not actually contributing in any meaningful way. Conscious SSH in Python, uh, and that actually is pretty impressive. Um, written by uh, Paul Schwartz, I say 2002, I'm not actually sure. Uh, I didn't look it up, that was just a guess, so don't quote me on that. Has been enhanced a lot, and believe it or not, it's the single largest subproject in Twisted in terms of lines of code. And here you can actually see that. The only thing that beats it is the main uh, test suite. And at 18,500 lines, that's, that's a significant code base uh, for a network protocol implementation. Um, and it's worth mentioning Twisted actually has 150,000 lines in it. Now, the last time I checked this is, was, must have been years and years ago. And it was just breaking 100. So that's 50% increase in a few years. So why do we want SSH, uh, SSH in Python? You've already got open SSH. It works perfectly well for the most part. Uh, I actually am a fan of open SSH. Uh, I think it's overall, it's a great product. But Python has some advantages. It's a lot easier to read, to not see. Hopefully it's harder to screw up, uh, hopefully. Um, and it's always good to have more than one implementation of a uh, core protocol. And it's in Twisted, which means it's 100% compatible with everything that's ever been written for Twisted or that is Twisted compatible or that integrates with the Twisted main loop uh, or that integrates with the GTK main loop. Any, any, any main loop that Twisted integrates with would be compatible with this code. So that's something. OK, that's the wrong slide. Uh, these are just a, cu a couple of references. I'm going to dive actually into the main code and uh, start describing the uh, basically the case study that, that I've put together. Um, working Katura video, we had the problem that, you know, we're shipping out all these Katura boxes and uh, folks are paying for support on those machines. And those are Linux machines. And um, we need to be able to get in there. We need to be able to shell in there to re upgrade packages. Um, and they're being installed in universities, which means there's 
an endless array of different firewall configurations that you're never going to get around. And policy prevents them from even port forwarding. But you can make client connections. So that's what we do. Uh, we have a central server. It's a, a conch SSH server. And uh, we are, we're running basically, it's basically a reverse shell proxy. Um, I wish I had a diagram to show you exactly how it works, but if you, uh, if you just listen to how I describe it, it should be fairly clear. This is actually uh, uh, a SSH uh, server here that I'm running right now. So this is a twisted server that you see running. Uh, it's, running it's actually running on two ports. One is just a, um, a manhole port, which uh, if you've never seen manhole, you should definitely check that out. That gives you a Python shell into your twisted process. So asynchronously, you just shell directly into your Python program, and you don't get a uh, Unix shell. You get a Python prompt, and it has syntax highlighting and maybe even tab completion. I actually haven't even tried this. I'm just going to see if it even will accept me. Ah. Take a little detour and show off manhole if this works. Um, oh, okay, well. <laughs> that's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that and put that import back in there. But uh, in the meantime, the actual main uh, gist of my talk is about conch and in particular running a RPC protocol on top of your SSH channel. So SSH is not just for shells or copying files. It's a general purpose, uh, fairly advanced networking protocol. And it's multiplexing. What that means is you uh, run multiple channels, uh, well, multiple sessions and multiple channels in those sessions, uh, I believe, to do different things. So over a single connection, you could have several cell sh uh, shell, se sh shell sessions open. You could be transferring files at the same time. Uh, now what I'm doing here um, is the client to this server is a uh, um, reverse, it's a, a slave program. And so you see I'm giving it known hosts. It's a client program. Uh, and it'll verify known hosts. So it will not connect. And what, it do, what it's doing, the reason it verifies this very closely is because it's giving up a shell on itself. It's uh, giving up a capability on the machine. You're, you're, at the, you're at the machine that you need to get access to from a central location. You run the client. It connects to the central server. Um, and then other people are able to shell into the central server behind the scenes in Twisted it connects the two protocols together and proxies all of the SSH channel requests back and forth. So you have a full two-way SSH channel proxy. And that is pretty cool because you shell in over here uh, to the server, and then you shell in from your support machine. You tell it which machine you're interested in connecting to out of the list of connected clients, and then it opens up a new shell, a uh, new SSH channel back through the existing connection for that client and requests a shell on the client. Now normally SSH, open SSH, when you run an open SSH client, it's not going to honor shell requests. <laughs> uh, that'd be really bad if it did that. But in this case, it's actually pretty useful. So we, uh, that connected, that worked. And um, what it's doing is it connects to, now I'm, all the code that's here I'm making available so you know you can play around with these things yourself and uh, come up with your own solutions but if you look at the log it's very verbose that's one uh, problem with conch right now unfortunately is that there's a lot of verbose debug logging in there that doesn't really have to be there uh, but you can see that it authenticated with an RSA uh, key actually let me show you which key it's using because that's not clear um, So this, uh, this program has some options, and the default SSH key is one I've already generated. Um, that's uh, client ID RSA in the current directory. So that client ID, RD, uh, client ID RSA, the, uh, the fingerprint for that exists in an authorized key file, just like you would have with a normal 
open SSH, SSH server. So we've got the same thing. Nice thing about Twisted is it's, it's easy to extend it. There's no reason why you have to keep your authentication database in an authorized key file. You could have it in a SQL database. It doesn't really matter. All you have to have access to are the, uh, the key blobs for the public key so you can authenticate the, uh, the peer's public key and then continue the RSA negotiation. Um, yeah, what was I doing here? <coughs> yeah, so it, uses, um, so it uses that ID to connect, and then the server is, use, is running out of this authorized key file, which already has that key in it. So it allows, it allows the client to connect with the SSH key and then uh, once the client connects, it makes a subsystem request. So uh, SSH has a concept of subsystems, <coughs> which are very useful. And you can run uh, basically, uh, SFTP is a good example. SFTP uh, runs on its own subsystem. Um, and that's pretty handy. Whereas SCP is actually running shell commands on your server, so if you want a lockdown file server that's running over SSH, you should always use SFTP. You can chroot it very easily, and you don't have to give anybody access to run any commands. Um, and of course, you can do the same thing with conch. Um, I'll get into the actual code in just a second. Um, So our a reverse shell client has connected. Uh, it sends a subsystem request for the AMP subsystem. Now AMP, you know, how many people know what AMP is, the protocol? Only one? Uh, AMP was a, an RPC protocol. So just think about any other RPC protocol you're already familiar with, XML RPC. We're running a full RPC protocol inside that AMP, sub, uh, inside that SSH subsystem. Uh, and it doesn't offer shell services. So you cannot directly shell into this machine. It's running an SSH server, but it's not honoring shell requests, shell uh, session requests. But it will proxy your shell request to some other client that's there waiting to service such a request. And that's what this client does. This client connects. And uh, when it, uh, if we look in the server log when it connects, the way I have it set up is it uh, creates this ticket and it's effectively a one-time password. And so, uh, I hope this, uh, this works. <laughs> so if you take that, that ticket, so when the, when the client here in tab number two connected, the server remembered that connection uh, and it assigned it a random one-time password and it printed it out in the log file. So an administrator could get, it, could get to it somehow. If you copy that and uh, just using normal open SSH right now, uh, this gave me a problem with that territory username. I might be able to, to solve that before, but let's see here. Uh, we're going to use the same, the same authentication key uh, because that's already in the database. And then as the username, that's where the one-time password goes. That tells it which machine you want to you want to proxy to. So you have, we have all of our Kutura appliances connected to our central server. When one of our techs needs to connect to one of those systems, we just look it up, find the key uh, for that active connection, give them that key. They can make a one-time SSH request to our server, looks up that key, real-time proxies them to the, to the uh, what we call a support client, because we're supporting those machines and then request a shell on that machine. And so you just go straight in uh, to the machine you want to get to. Now this is failing because it's, it's saying something about unknown uh, username Territorn, I think. Uh, and I don't know where that's coming from, to be honest. Now, if you grep recursive, that greps everything, right? Mm, oh, it's in run slave. 
Oh, right. Okay, I'm just not, I'm, I'm using the defaults. It's the default, uh, that's, that's it. Okay. Okie dokie. So we just need to specify a uh, shell user. So this is the user that it's going to spawn the reverse shell as. Uh, we say shell user equals M A L A C O D A. I, I, I wrote this software on my, on my Ubuntu and then I was running it on my Slackware and then my Slackware wouldn't output VGA so I had, I've copied it all to Triscoll and <laughs> reinstalled everything and it, it actually is working so I'm surprised I'm even here able to give this talk at all. We're still active. Now it connected again, so I have to copy the ticket because that's a new ticket. And if I cross my fingers, we might actually see the reverse shell land. Yes. So we're actually shelled in over localhost through a reverse proxy um, back to the same machine. So that's pretty cool. So yeah, that's what I've been having fun with the last uh, few months. <laughs> um, and there's all and and also the um, and you have full RPC. And this I, I think it's much better to run RPC protocols over SSH honestly than TLS. Um, I don't know about you guys, but every time I think about generating SSL certificates, I just sort of crawl up into the fetal position and. Uh, I <laughs> Uh, using the OpenSSL command line is just an exercise in frustration. But general, everybody knows how to do key management with SSH, right? Everybody uses SSH. You already know how to do key management with SSH. So now you can do that and use other protocols on top of it, uh, not just shells and files and stuff. So. Uh, uh, can you repeat that? Yes, that, yeah, you can see it right here. That's, that's the user that I'm logged in at as on this computer. So that's, that's the user account on this computer. Um, and you can see, now it's the exact same SSH server that you're connecting to. Um, the, uh, the client, so this, uh, what I call the slave, uh, slave client, it's connecting to the exact same SSH server. Um, and it requests the AMP subsystem, and then it makes a single RPC call called uh, offer shell. And what that does, that just says, hey, okay, I, uh, yeah, I actually want to let people connect back to a shell on this computer. And so you have to make an explicit call to indicate to the server that it's uh, that the protocol has progressed past that step and it's okay to connect because other SSH clients are not going to be running AMP. For example, the open SSH client that I just ran, you know, it doesn't know anything about AMP at all, but it's connecting to the exact same SSH server. So when it connects, it just looks at that username and says, hey, is that, a, is that an actual one-time password or a, a, token, um, a ticket in the database? If it doesn't match the ticket, um, then you don't get any special privileges and it just connects you to the uh, quote unquote public uh, AMP uh, API that's, that's available. So this, this AMP API that I'm running here is just called aid AMP date echo just because it operates a, um, a date and an echo service uh, over SSH, over, or over AMP over SSH. So AMP is actually, I would recommend everyone to check out AMP because if you need to do RPC, it's a very simple way. It's very, it's very, very straightforward, easy to implement. You literally could, you literally could implement your use case for AMP in a new language in probably about 30 minutes, uh, that network protocol. Um, but it's flexible enough to do pretty much uh, everything. And so, uh, let's see which file. Um, oh yeah. So this is, this is what a, uh, just a quick detour into, into AMP. This is what an AMP um, protocol looks like in Twisted. So you are, you're inheriting from AMP.AMP, .amp, which is your protocol that understands how to speak the, the basic wire level encoding and decoding of values on the wire. You don't have to deal with that directly. Um, I'm not going to worry about explaining what these are. Options are just command line options. 
a factory is something that just produces protocol objects for each connection. Um, and then the avatar represents a user that's logged in. Um, and so you just set up these, uh, there's three commands. Um, here, there's the, uh, the echo command, which just accepts a single message and it returns back, uh, AMP is all key value pairs. So requests are just a set of key value pairs and responses is also a set of key value pairs. So there is no, there are no request arguments for this command, or I'm sorry, there's one message and then the response is echo. Uh, and then date, so we have a date service running on the AMP subsystem. Uh, I think I should be able to hit that. Oh, let's see. Um, let's see here. Um, so I have a uh, date client file. It's got some options. The defaults are okay. Um, now I need to set that known host file because that's not right. It's the good file. Okay, and we want to tell it what server connecting to. Huh? Uh. No such file or directory os.git login. Okay. I don't know what that what that's all about. Um the uh, date client, oh, there's no file. That would explain it. Success. So we connected over SSH, verifying the host key, logging in with a private key, requesting the AMP subsystem, and then making a single RPC call to the date command. And that actually works. So you can ping your AMP server and echo bytes off it to your heart's content. Uh, and you can see here, it's just it just gets the uh, creates the responder. So you still write your AMP code just the way you normally would. You don't have to care. That's one of the beautiful things about Twisted is it's, it has a, uh, a very nice abstraction, a distinction between protocol and transport. So a transport gets bytes from, not octets, eight bits from here to there. Um, and then a protocol is what you do with those bytes. So the, the transport just is the, uh, the physical wire or the abstraction of the physical wire. In, the, in this case, it'd be a SSH channel. is actually a logical transport. And then we can hook any twisted protocol because twisted protocols are simply byte uh, oriented to that. And that's what it's doing right here. Uh, just gets the current UTC time and sends it back to AMP as a native uh, date time object, which, which it understands how to encode on the wire into a stable format. Uh, feel free to jump in with any questions, by the way, if there's anything that you'd like to ask about Twisted or Conch or my talk. Uh, basically, the 
the gist of this talk is just showing off this code, this, this work that I've been doing for my company. Um, and unfortunately, I had to refactor it heavily. Um, our code is you know, tied into our code base. That's what I've been doing all last night and today is tearing it all out and refactoring it and putting it here so I can release it free and clear. Um, how, uh, how am I doing on time, by the way? 15 minutes? OK. Here, this is the, uh, the actual proxy class. It's kind of interesting. So you have a, an SSH channel in Twisted. And um, um, you can see when that channel gets uh, opened, it uh, fires back a deferred, blah, blah, blah. And it has a little method here. So you just call proxy2, and you give it the, the SSH channel that represents the peer, your proxy peer. Uh, and then it knows that it's proxying to that one. And then also on that one, you call proxy2, and you hand it this one. So they're both pointing at each other, proxying requests back and forth. And you have to proxy everything, data, extended data, which is standard error data, end of file notification. So all these things have to be proxied to have an effective SSH bridge. Um, and of course, the requests. So the requests have to be all proxied as well. This is a bunch of just uh, uninteresting code that just does a lookup to, uh, f to find the, um, it looks up the, uh, well, it already looked up the ticket and it put onto the connection who you're connecting to. So you connect, you log in, it looks at your ticket, and then it's like, okay, I know where that's going. And then it stores that data on your shell connection just because it's asynchronous and you have to wait until you get to this point in the code to actually use that data. So the data is stored in this underscore connect to ad hoc data structure. It just grabs it and then makes the uh, proxy connection. Um, go ahead. Well, luckily, I didn't have to understand it too much. I did have to understand it to the level of differentiating between channels and sessions. Um, I did get help, honestly, from the author of Twisted, or the author of Conch, uh, when I was working for my company doing this stuff. The best resources, uh, I do have a couple of, I do have one, one good link that uh, they're, well, first of all, they're basic examples in Twisted that demonstrate conch and SSH. So there are some base examples already in the distribution. Uh, and JP Calderon has a uh, series called um, Twisted Conch in 60 Seconds. So by, you definitely want to read all of those. They're, they don't cover everything, but they cover a lot. And I think I have that. Um, oh, yeah. That, that slide was not finished. But if you Google conch in 60 seconds, you've got it. So I would start with that. And that's that Crondo. If you want to learn Twisted, that's a great link also right there. Uh, if you just search for uh, Twisted Crondo tutorial, it'll pull that right up. Basically just goes everything from beginning asynchronous programming, you know, event-driven programming, and then leads into Twisted and how you, how you use it. And uh, so back to the, the nitty-gritty. Does that answer your question? So the base, base examples, Twisted Conch in 60 seconds. Uh, and don't be afraid to ask on the mailing list. Twisted Conch, unfortunately, is, is poorly documented at this point. I would love to have more people using it and um, reporting their problems and you know, improving the documentation. Uh, maybe write some how-tos or something. Hopefully some, ex some example code and some more docs will come out of this, uh, this presentation. Um, bunch of boring SSH protocol junk. Some of this code had to be, unfortunately, lifted out of Twisted. So if you want to do this advanced stuff, copy the code I have, because I put a lot of work and effort and, and bug fixing and banging my head. And there's a couple of open tickets in the Twisted tracker that I had to work around to make everything work the way we needed it to work. Uh, but for the most part, it's actually a very uh, solid product. Um, I know every time I use uh, BZR on Windows, 
it, uh, it fires up conch to do an SSH connection to do my DZR checkouts. If it's good enough for them, I guess it's, I guess it's good enough for anybody. Uh, yeah, so this, just, this is just creating a, uh, a simple TCP server. Loads up the private key, loads up the public key. Creates a dictionary for those tickets that I was showing you. Um, sets the SSH connection it's going to use. Um, gives it a uh, portal. That's a, a concept from Twisted Cred. Just allows, it's an authentication framework. Um, you don't really have to dig into it too deeply to use this code. Uh, but just understand it has really confusing terminology like portal and realm and mind and have I missed, is there any other confusing cred terminology I should throw out there? <laughs> I probably shouldn't have, I probably shouldn't have said anything, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you create a checker, authorized keys. So I'll look at, let's look at that authorized keys, see how that works. Uh, that's actually interesting because there's quite a, a few reasons why you might want to have your authorized keys stored in various different ways. Um, yeah, so it has a uh, method called uh, check key. Um, uh, it verifies the signature. Uh, and then down here, after it verifies the signatures and everything, uh, it actually verifies that the key exists in your uh, in your database, so um, this is actually parsing an authorized uh, keys file here. Uh, unfortunately, I, this code already exists in Twisted, but I forget exactly why I had to lift it out uh, in this example. Um, but you can see here that the only key comparison is this: uh, as long as the key itself is valid, um, then as long as the blob contents match, you're golden. It'll accept your key. So you can store your key blobs in any kind of database. Uh, and then with, with conch, you can authenticate out of that database uh, at will. So and all, all the stuff around that is just a bunch of boilerplate, uh, pretty boring stuff. Is this exciting? Do you guys like hearing about SSH and AMP and stuff? OK, I'm getting some nods. I'm going to look at some other files here. Uh, time? About five minutes? Josh? Yeah, I have a question. Your turn. Did you ever use Paramico? Ah, uh, the question is could I have used Paramico? Yeah, uh, Paramico I think is a good product. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But as far as I know, it doesn't integrate with Twisted, so it's basically its own blocking API, as far as I know. So it's not quite, it's not really, is it really? <laughs> that's, that's a bad name, yeah. I, I say use conch. Uh, it's, it's good, it works, it's getting better. Ah. I see. Uh, I don't understand the question. <laughs> well, there's the, I, I've never found a I've never found a place where I couldn't fit Twisted in and meet the requirements that I had. So I, um, I I guess there have been a couple of a couple of little places where you just want some little script or something that that does something. So yeah, you could certainly use Paramico. Um, and you could even use it if you wanted to use it with, with AMP, for example, or a different RPC protocol, you could. Um, AMP is implemented in pure Python uh, outside of Twisted, so you would be able to connect those two synchronous libraries together, basically, and, and make it work. So let me see if there's any, anything else interesting in this code. Look at the AMP responders. Yeah, that was one of the basically requirements of this of this system. Um, I mean, the system I'm showing you here is is basically the same system we have uh, at my company. Um, the the basic twisted code is is effectively the same. 
Um, yeah, so with that slave client, that's connecting outbound from the machine that's behind the firewall. <laughs> so 99 times out of 100, there's not going to be a problem with that. And if you have to run it on some port that's allowed, then you can do that. You know, if you have to run SSH on port 80, you can do that. <laughs> I'm not going to come after you and, and stop you. Um. Uh, yeah, this AMP client file is just something that I wrote like in the last couple of hours and it just, it just abstracts the notion of connecting to an SSH server, verifying the host key, requesting the AMP subsystem, and then hooking that up to your own AMP protocol, which implements your own commands, your own specific logic uh, for that channel. So you actually can use this file. Um, the implementation details are not too interesting. If you're interested, you can just read those, but I'll show you how you use it. Um, in uh, the date time script is where I'm using uh, that. Or a date client. So I import uh, from uh, aid import amp client. And I also import the, uh, the date. That's the, uh, the amp command that, that represents the uh, the command we're going to send across the wire. And so you can share those commands between clients and servers, different code bases. You can all share the same command definition. Um, yep. OK, parse some command line options. Now, here's the actual uh, date time client protocol. And it's exactly like a standard twisted protocol. Uh, in connection made, that's how we know that we have the final connection and we're ready to process transactions. We go ahead and fire off a call remote for the date command, attach a callback, print out the result when that comes back or fail. Either way, we're stopping the reactor and closing the uh, script. And to hook up that protocol, all you have to do is this one class. You have um, uh, make a subclass of AMP client, SSH client, implement, your, implement an AMP protocol attribute that points at your protocol. And it doesn't have to be AMP specific. You could change the code to make this reference some other protocol. Uh, it really doesn't make any difference. But this talk is just focusing on AMP. So, uh, And then down here is the only boilerplate that you really need in order to get the client uh, off the ground. Create a factory, give it the username, set the protocol. There's two protocols. Um, there's the outer protocol that negotiates SSH, blah, 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 makes the subsystem requests, all that stuff. Then once the world is set up and ready for, uh, ready for your pristine AMP protocol to take over, then that's where that protocol takes over. Um, known host, make a TCP connection to a host and port, give it the factory to produce protocol objects out of for each connection and run the reactor. And that's, that's all there is to that. So you can very easily um, add, other, uh, add other commands to this uh, protocol and make it do just about you know, anything in the world. Um, did I do this right? This is right, isn't it? You read a seed out of view random and seed a random number generator? That's just, that just generates those tickets, that I was, uh, those 16 character uh, tickets. So, and actually it regenerates those whenever you, you might not want this in production, you might want like a stable, a stable one-time password, so it wouldn't technically be one time. Uh, you know, you could, you could SSH to the same server using the same ticket multiple times. That's not allowed here, they're, they're actually one time only, so I'll, I'll just show that off. Uh, and normally, this is not using a reconnecting client factory, which is a twisted thing. So in our production code, our clients, they use reconnecting client factory so that when the server drops out or the internet goes down, they retry to connect to the server and reestablish your connection to your protocol. Uh, and just out of the box twisted does adds jitter to that reconnect and it also adds delay, uh, fall off delay based on some derivative of a Planck constant, I think. It's out of control. I don't, 
I don't know where they get these numbers from, these magic numbers, but um, you can look it up in the Twisted Source somewhere. Uh, okay. So we're running a server. Let's make a slave connection. Get the, uh, the ticket that came in for that. So we can reverse shell through it. Um, mm -hmm. So if we give it the right token, it should give us another shell. Cool. Um, and then in the log, uh, you'll see all this verbose garbage, and then right here, it consumed the one-time password and then regenerated a new one on the server side. So if you wanted to connect again, you'd have to go look it up again or have some admin tell you what it is. Whoop. And then we can actually take that, and we should be able to have multiple concurrent connections all over that single back channel. Uh, Okay, that's, that's actually logged into a new shell there. And I'll go ahead and log in again just to prove it. All right, there it is. And oh, it doesn't have shared history. That's not good. Yeah, I apologize for having to use this different equipment. It, it would have gone a lot smoother if I just had my uh, normal laptop, but that's all right. So, shelled in once. Okay, shell in again. With the new ticket. For God's sake. Yeah, I need technical help here. I, I really do. I really do. Does that work? Hey, sweet. Okay, you actually so we're shelled in twice now with the same back channel. So that's that's pretty cool. Well. This this code is not very advanced. I mean, you'd have to add you'd have to add some like nice little management stuff to this. Um, I mean, we have web apps for all our stuff, but I, I'm not I'm not showing off any of that here. Um, yeah, as far as which channel, see that's that's one thing that this code is is lacking in. It's just like okay, here's a uh, here's a connection from from who from where you know it's not listed. So normally you'd print out when you get that connection, you print out the IP it comes from and the port it's coming from, and then you sort of know who it is. And also in our code, we have, a, uh, we have a different AMP command called identify. And so the clients are, are nice. They're nice clients because they're our clients. And so they identify themselves as who they're, who they're supposed to be. And so with that, you can tell who that client is. Now each client, each, each client out there that's connecting back to your support uh, system is going to have a separate SSH key. So I didn't do this, but I kind of would recommend it is to just use the public keys as identity. So when, uh, when they log in with a given public key and you do that lookup in the database, then you know their identity right then. And for example, we uh, like Assembla, when you commit to Assembla, you can put in whatever username and email you want. And it's like, as soon as you authenticate with that SSH key, it already has forgotten who you are. And uh, there's no reason for that. So and, uh, ideally, you would use those SSH keys. Um, and then you'd look those up in your database. You'd have your metadata there. OK, this is such and such machine at such and such university, um, because they're the only ones that have this specific key. And then you'd know when you want to connect to that machine, then you would know exactly which, exactly which one to go to, which token to use. So that's, that's how that would work, yeah, ideally. Um, Uh, I'm not too familiar with SOX 5. I guess I guess you can I guess it'll proxy sort of any any protocol, won't it? It's not just HTTP, right? 
Yeah. I, I really wouldn't know how to how you would hook that up. Which part would you want behind the SOX proxy? The the client the clients would have to go through a SOX. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I don't see why not. As long as you can just run the normal SSH over that SOX connection, uh, you should be golden. Because once you establish that pipe out, then you've got the pipe back. So it'll work. And uh, Twisted does have SOX. I'm not sure we have SOX 5. I know we have SOX. Yeah. Nobody wants, nobody's using it or writing tests for it. Yeah, there's definitely there's definitely room for uh, you could do a lot of so yeah, you could do a lot with Sox Five now, probably a little bit of room for improvement there too. I mean, Twisted is big. I mean, like I showed you, it's 150,000 lines. So, the core is excellent, well documented, you know, functional code is beautiful, and the core spans a lot of you know different parts. But then you get to the outer fringes. So like some of these like this debugging all this debugging junk in here. You know, that's the outer fringes of Twisted that hasn't been cleaned up quite quite the way some of the other code has been. Um, that said, it's functional. It has a lot of unit tests and it actually does work very well. Uh, it's just a little bit a little bit dirty, a little bit rough around the edges. Um, and actually my code had unit tests too, but um, in refactoring, I didn't have time to refactor the test, so you have, you have to write your own test for this code. Any more questions? Is there anything that I've that you saw here that I jumped over that you wanted to ask me about? I'll uh, I'll try to make uh, these files available online. I'll probably um, I'll just I'll put them on my GitHub. I uh, I have a GitHub uh, Terratorn that's uh, I'll just make it part of the, uh, the talk here. So if you want to get it later, it's not up there right now, but um, just because I was pressed for time. But if you just look up uh, Theratorn at uh, GitHub uh, later on today, you should be able to, uh, spelled like that, you should be able to find it. Uh, let's see if there's anything else in these files. Otherwise, I think I'm getting pretty close to wrapping it up. Look at the date client. Yep. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, I can't really think of anything else to uh, talk about. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here.